Next up, we've got a speaker a who's, most of you won't know him. Um, he's pretty new to Prometheus. He's called Julius. And he's be talking about, he'll be talking about best practices and beastly pitfalls. Yeah, I'm probably actually the person with the longest years of Prometheus experience out there. <laughs> well, except for uh, Matt. <laughs> um, all right, welcome to Prometheus Best Practices and Beastly Pitfalls. Uh, I had to put the beastly in there for Brian because that's like an alliteration type kind of thing that makes it sound more exciting. Um, so as you might know, Prometheus, the monitoring system, was named after this person here, Prometheus, the ancient Greek titan. And what's he most famous for? For stealing the fire from the gods and bringing it to the humans. and. So that's amazing, but, you know, oh, let me just get rid of this mirror display kind of thing here. Yeah. Um, as a punishment for that, he got tied to a rock for all of eternity by the gods and uh, basically got his liver picked out every day again and again, and it regrew again and again. Um, and as Richard here likes to say, sometimes Prometheus feels more like in the first picture, but on some days it feels, you know, like using Prometheus feels more like in, in the second picture. And so uh, the goal of this talk is to make it, you feel at least somewhat more like in the, you know, make you feel more often like you're in the, in the first picture, <laughs> like illuminating your systems. Um, it's kind of, in, I would say, an entry level, some intermediate kind of level talk stuff, and you've already heard some of it today from other speakers. Um, I'm going to cover instrumentation, alerting, and querying. Uh, I had architecture and topology in there earlier, but then I noticed I only have a 20-minute slot. Um, so that's what we have for now. So I'll start pretty general with instrumentation. Not really Prometheus specific, but Prometheus is a very efficient metric storing system. Um, and it's all about having good white box instrumentation in your uh, software. So really one big recommendation is to add metrics through all, throughout all of your major components of your software, including libraries that, it, that they use, uh, so that you don't have to wrap any libraries that you use um, with metrics. Um, spread the metrics very liberally everywhere where you would traditionally have had or still have a log line. Just add a dimensionless counter. Like, you know, Prometheus is very good at handling big dimension, uh, dimensional metrics, but the ones that don't even have any dimensions, they are so cheap, just add them everywhere. And it just makes it very easy to figure out like how many times a certain errors happened or, or things like that. Um, there's two methods that uh, Alexander mentioned in his talk already, the use method and the red method. Uh, the use method got coined by Brendan Gregg. Um, that's, so these are two methods that just give you a guideline around what metrics in general to add to your software. Uh, the use method is for when you have something that looks a bit like a resource, you know, like a, a queue, a CPU, or a disk, where you want to track utilization, saturation, and errors. And you can find more about that on the link given there. Uh, the red method was coined by Tom Wilkie, who is in the audience here somewhere, if he has made it here today. Ah, back there. Um, so it's just a kind of a complementary uh, method that works better if you have something that looks like a service endpoint that receives requests. And so you want to track the request rate, and you want to track the total error rate, and also the uh, latency distribution, so D, duration. <clears throat> getting more Prometheus specific. Um, Prometheus doesn't really uh, have any server-side typing of metrics or knowledge of units. Uh, there's some typing in the client libraries, you know, gauges, counters, histograms, that even gets put into the wire format, but then just gets thrown away by the Prometheus server up on ingestion. Plans to change that, but not yet. Um, 
So to make metrics more useful to work with for humans, we have a set of conventions that we recommend for everyone to follow if you're adding metrics, your own metrics to your own software. Uh, first would be really add unit suffixes. And if you're adding these units, like bytes, seconds, and so on, keep them uh, as base units. So seconds versus milliseconds, bytes, better than kilobytes or megabytes or so. Um, this just makes it easier just by looking at a metric name to know what unit is it is in and also do not have to convert when you're doing arithmetics between different metrics or comparisons or so on. Uh, you want to distinguish gauges from counters, so current tallies of things from cumulative counts over time by having an underscore total suffix on counters. Um, and having none so, no such suffix on, on gauges. Um, now there's a really uh, nice rule of thumb that I like. Um, it is that all the series that belong to the same metric name should, it should either make sense to sum over all of them or to average over all of them in the usual case. So that means basically that all the label dimensions on a given metric name should partition that metric space completely and without overlap. Meaning, let's say, for example, you are exposing uh, CPU usage metrics in seconds, and you want to have a mode label on there. You might want to have modes like mode equals idle, mode equals user, mode equals system. But don't add something like mode equals total, because that actually overlaps with the others. And if you know sum over the whole thing, you'll get the double counted. Instead, leave that out. Do any such summing and calculations in Prometheus instead. And in other situations, you might want to split certain parts out of the metric name. There's some uh, situations where this rule doesn't apply, like if you're bridging some existing table kind of based metrics uh, into Prometheus. More details on the website of Prometheus.io about the naming. Follow this if you are adding metrics to your own software. It'll make everyone's lives easier. Label cardinality. Um, <laughs> this is also a, a pretty obvious one, but something that still happens to everyone who starts using Prometheus the first time. Uh, they end up putting something in the label value that they shouldn't. Um, keep in mind that every unique set of labels creates one new time series. And Prometheus you know, has a limited number of time series that it can track at any given time. It's not a log-based system, it tracks series. Um, so, you know, don't put public IP addresses, user IDs, or um, um, SoundCloud track IDs into a label value, um, because otherwise your Prometheus will immediately blow up. It will create potentially, you know, millions, billions of series. Um, so keep your label values generally well bounded. Um, keep in mind that the cardinalities are multiplicative. So to get to the total number of series that you will have to deal with in a given Prometheus server, uh, you have to multiply you know, all the metrics with the individual cardinalities of their labels times the number of targets you have that you're scraping for those metrics. Um, and then you'll end up at the total number of metrics that you have. And, uh, the limits that actually ultimately matter are what Prometheus can do on the ingestion side and what it can do on the query side. And for the ingestion side, a single Prometheus server typically is fine with a couple of million uh, active series at the same time. Um, and queries, you typically want to still be able to, at least in the tabular view, in the instant query view, be able to query one metric name uh, with all of its series without any further filters so that you can start exploring from there. Um, so also try to keep a single metric to maybe a couple of tens of thousands of uh, series, but that should be really the upper limit. Uh, so choose your metrics, the labels on them, and the number of targets accordingly just to kind of stay within those limits. So if you have something that handles requests that can fail and succeed, one of the you know, first things that people typically do intuitively is they add two counters, one for successes and one for failures. Um, or sometimes they might even have, you know, a single metric with a label, but this is actually nicer. Um, so the problem here is, uh, yes, it gives you all the information, but one of the typical uh, calculations that you will want to do with this information is to get a ratio of the failed requests to all requests. And to do that, now you have to do an extra addition uh, on the, the right-hand side of the division here, uh, basically adding up 
uh, all the successes with all the failures. So the ratio expression gets quite complicated. So instead of tracking failures and successes, track the failures and the total number of requests. And then your ratios just get a bit simpler. Missing series. Um, this is a bit of a tricky uh, one. Um, so imagine you have a metric ops total that is a counter, counts how many ops of a given type have happened so far. Op types might be create, update, delete, this kind of thing. Uh, the Prometheus client libraries have no idea what label values can exist for a given label when you're creating a metric. So as long as no event for a certain type has happened yet, the series for that type will simply be absent in the metrics output. Um, or if no type has happened at all so far, then there will be no series at all for this metric yet. And this can get a bit confusing if you want to have, let's say, a graph over the total rate of operations as averaged over the last five minutes. If no operation at all has happened yet, you will get an empty graph instead of a flat zero line. Similar, if you are selecting uh, for a particular op type in this rate and that particular operation type hasn't happened yet, again, you'll get an empty graph instead of a zero line. And this is kind of dangerous because it cannot only mess up your graphs, it can also you know, make alerts silent and not alert. So be aware of this. If feasible, uh, initialize known label values to zero. Uh, this is when you can conveniently enumerate all the label values. In Go, it would look something like this, where you just you know, could iterate through the ones, like create, delete, and so on, uh, and then just mention uh, the particular label value on that uh, dimensionful metric, and don't include a dot .inc at the end to actually increment it. And in this way, um, this dimension gets referenced and created, but initialized to zero. And the series will appear, but it's still a zero counter. You don't need to do anything for metrics that already uh, don't have any labels at all, because the Prometheus client library can automatically initialize them to zero. So sometimes this is not feasible, um, because you might have something like HTTP status codes. And while you could go through hundreds of status codes, uh, you might not want to create that many series that will never be used and so on. Um, so again, in this case, either you have to be aware of the problem when looking at a graph that you know, it might be empty and it should be a zero rate graph or so, um, or you can use the or set operator in different ways, uh, different combinations, depending on your exact expression to uh, make, you know, to, to join in series for a metric name which you know will always exist, like the up time series for the same job for which you are selecting data from. Um, there's a nice blog post from Robust Perception where you can learn more about that. That's linked down there. <laughs> metric normalization. Um, try to not put anything into label values or into labels in generally that's not uh, strictly needed for the identification of a given uh, series. Um, so let's say you are building something like a node exporter and you're exposing CPU and disk usage and so on. Uh, don't put something like a machine role label into every metric that exporter exposes um, because this breaks series continuity every time uh, the machine role changes, you know, the label changes, and then you have a completely new set of time series. It's kind of unnecessary. Uh, you might also have a lot of this kind of metadata that you don't all want to stuff into labels. So what's often a better uh, thing to do is to have a completely separate metric in that exporter that only contains that label and has a sample value of one, and you can then join that in doing a query when you really need it. Let's talk a bit about some alerting gotchas. So starting general again, um, there's this famous my philosophy on alerting document from Rob Evershock. Who has heard about that before? Yeah, like half the people. OK, well, third, maybe. Um, uh, Google it. It's some Google Doc link, so I couldn't really you know, put it in the slide in a useful way. Um, 
but it's really great. Like it really outlines a good philosophy on how alerting should work. Uh, the gist of it, some some points of it are that you should really alert on user visible symptoms of your service. Do not try to alert on underlying causes. There can be too many underlying causes and it can be just too noisy. You know, some cause might actually create an alert but not create a user visible problem. Um, so, you know, alert on the actual user visible stuff um, with the exception of causes that could cause, you know, a really bad problem very soon now, like a disk running full in, in the next four hours or so. Generally, err on the side of fewer pages that generally, you know, on-call fatigue is a real thing, so you don't, you know, you'll actually react better to pages if you get fewer of them and they ha contain less noise. Uh, still add a lot of causal metrics to your software and collect it and so on that will then help you debug why something is broken once you know that it is broken, once you have received a page. Right, so let's say you have uh, a service in Prometheus that you're monitoring and it is handling requests and you want to alert in case uh, the, you know, the, the error rate goes over 10 per second and you're adding this alert, and that's amazing, and congratulations, that works most of the time. But what happens if Prometheus either cannot scrape your targets at all, um, for whatever reason, they might be down, there might be network problem or whatever, or your service discovery or your Prometheus configuration doesn't even contain those targets. So basically, in both cases, this metric that the expression here is referring to, errors total, will just simply not be present in Prometheus. And this alerting rule will create an empty output and you will not get an alert. So for all jobs in Prometheus, it's a good practice to have at least two types of kind of basic health alerts. The first one tells you whether the up series uh, wh whether, this, whether Prometheus knows that it should be scraping targets for the job you're referencing, um, but cannot. So every time it does a scrape, it records a synthetic up metric with a value of zero or one, and uh, you will want to alert in some way or another whether either you, every, any individual instance is down or some minimal uh, amount of them are present or not, or so, some, some variation of this kind of alert. Um, the second alert, um, is for the case where Prometheus doesn't even know that it is supposed, supposed to be scraping targets for this job, like the service discovery might not have returned any for them. Um, but you really expect, as a human, this job to be there. So in that case, Prometheus will not even create the up metric for this job and, and their instances. So you can use the absent function to detect that and alert on that as well. Um, Prometheus alerting rules allow you to set a for modifier uh, with a time duration where you can basically say after what time an alert should really start notifying you after it starts going bad. You know, like if an instance is down in this case here, um, if you're just saying, you know, alert me if up equals equals zero, then after a single failed scrape, you might already get a notification about a down instance. And you, that's very, you know, typically don't want that. You want to have some tolerance in there. So add something like 4 or 5M to this. Similar for the absent kind of alert and many other types of alerts. Um, in this case, with the absent alert on the up metric, um, if you have a completely fresh Prometheus server that doesn't have any data yet, or it has been down for a long time and you restart it, it might not have the up metric yet, but the uh, alerting rule might already run before the first scrapes and also alert you. So again, you know, add 4 5 M there. And in general, the recommendation would be even for alerts that already include some time windows like RAID windows and so on, uh, always, you know, make this at least five minutes or a couple of mini minutes um, just to be safe and to be more failure tolerant there. But also do not make the forward duration too long. Um, so, yeah, if, if you wanted to, for example, you know, alert when an instance has been down for a whole day, uh, the problem here is that Prometheus does not currently persist the for state for 
the given time series that result from an alert expression. So if the Prometheus server restarts, it will just begin them as, begin them as pending alerts anew. And let's say if your Prometheus server restarts at least once a day for a crash reason or some intended reason, uh, then you will never ever receive this alert. Uh, this might actually get fixed in the future. There's an issue for it. But, you know, try to make this at most one hour unless you know what you're doing. So alerts in Prometheus are useful because they have labels and because the parts in the chain that come after Prometheus can do useful stuff with the labels. Uh, alert manager can root on the labels. Uh, you can silence uh, alerts in there. For example, you might want to silence everything by a particular job label. Um, and also you can use those labels for notifications and so on and so on. So try to preserve as many useful labels as you can in both your recording rules but also your alerting rules. So let's say you wanted to alert on some rate being high in, uh, as, as summed over the entire job. Then at least try to keep, you know, the, this first expression here will drop all the, all the labels basically. Um, and that's okay, like most of them you actually want to just aggregate over, but there's many labels or several labels potentially in there that are common among all the series that are being summed over, and you will probably want to at least uh, keep those. And the one you typically at least want to keep is the job label, because that's very useful for silencing individual jobs or so on. So, you know, just think a bit about what labels you preserve at that stage. On the querying side, <clears throat> Keep in mind that a single metric name only has, you know, a single unique meaning within one binary. And a job kind of groups uh, instances of the same binary and configuration together, kind of like a service. Um, so just to be sure, if you like, at least you should be a bit extra paranoid, always try to add a job selector to your individual time series selectors. Uh, that really namespaces that metric to the binary it comes from, to the job it comes from. Um, yeah, otherwise you might get surprises and say, select something that you don't actually intend to. Um, yeah, sometimes people get the order of rate and sum the wrong way around. Um, but it's actually not that easy in Prometheus. So um, the question is, Let's say you know you have a bunch of counters being exported by, or let's say one counter by 100 instances, and now you want to have the total rate over all those 100 instances. You might think, well, I might just sum up over all the counters and then take the, the rate of increase of the sum. Why is this a problem? The problem is that counters can reset in Prometheus, and the rate function expects to see those resets and so that it can correct for them. So if you have a raw counter that kind of goes up and then resets and goes up again, um, you see the dark blue line is what the rate will actually be working with. It pretends as if that, like it, it will just treat any uh, decrease in value as a reset and pretends as if it had never happened. So generally, you know, if you have uh, one very slow moving counter that resets and one that increases uh, very rapidly, then let's see what happens if you sum first you actually get a counter that where you can't even see that a reset happened. There's just a plateau here. So this is an extreme example, but this also works in other examples, that uh, summing before taking the rate actually can mask the resets that can happen in individual counters at different times. So then rate will under-report the, the rate. So always take the sum of the rates and not the rate of the sums. PromQL actually makes it somewhat hard to do the wrong thing because you cannot take the rate uh, of an arbitrary expression. You can only take the rate of uh, something that has already been really recorded on disk as a time series. Um, but still, if you first pre-record the sum in a recording rule and then do the rate on the recorded recording rule result, you might still stumble into this problem, and people do. So that's why I'm talking about it. Um, yeah, thanks. That's already been it.
questions? Yes. Hi. Uh, you mentioned that uh, sometimes developers can, you know, accidentally create like tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of time series if they use like IDs and stuff like that. And I've actually personally seen that, you know, with other developers of other teams, you know, they learn to use a client. They don't know how many time series they're going to generate. So, and then things just sort of sort of go out of control. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of hard to scale that, you know, on a human level because I can't be part of every code review or like, you know, I, I can't necessarily tell this is going to happen. Is there any sort of future work plan on sort of combating this problem where like a developer accidentally just creates too many time series because he doesn't understand that, uh, you know, yeah. Cardinality issue. Um, so I, I think there are three answers maybe that I can give, and maybe Brian can fill in the rest. Um, first of all, you'll want to have, I mean, generally it's nice to have Prometheus servers per team, so the teams are actually responsible for what they break, and then they actually tend to learn faster than if you run a central Prometheus server for them. Uh, that's at least the experience I had, really. Like, everyone broke it once, but then they learned really quickly. Um, the other thing is there are two mitigation, mitigation strategies you can do on the Prometheus server level, uh, which one is a, a limit per scrape, where you can just uh, have a safety limit that allows you to say any scrape may only produce at most this many metrics. Um, and then there's another uh, metric relabel configs that allows you to uh, throw, you know, it's like relabeling, but on during scrape that allows you to throw away certain metrics. Um, yeah, that helps to a limited degree. I don't know, Ryan, if you want to uh, add something. Yeah, yeah. So those yeah. are the answers, yeah. which okay. is yes, they'll learn and they have their own. Uh, <laughs> using scrape limit, like set it way beyond what you need. It's just meant to be an emergency stop valve, basically. That it's better to stop Chris scraping that job than take out the Prometheus. And then as a mitigation, while the uh, developers are learning not to do this, you can drop it on the fly using metric label configs. Uh, actually, I think what we have not thought of for some reason is we could just instrument how many values there are for certain labels that alert on it to at least like give you a reasonable hint why yeah, Prometheus I mean, is degrading. You, you can, if, if your Prometheus isn't so overloaded yet that you can still query which metric is large, then you can actually query that already, right? With uh, Underscore, underscore name, and then like I mean, the I mean, a metric. Oh, a metric that you metric from which exports itself. Right. About like how many pair, uh, values. Ah, yeah. Like. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that, that sounds like a metric with an unbounded cardinality because you have any number of label names. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, but one thing I, I would like, and it should be easier now with the new storage, is a page on Prometheus telling you which are the biggest metrics and which are the biggest label names, just for debugging that sort yep. of thing. Because you'll normally find any given Prometheus that at least half the resources are taken up by like 10 metrics. Uh, and that's pretty normal. Like I've seen um, previous similar monitoring systems where 80% of all monitoring resources were taken up by a single histogram. And this is not unusual. Yeah, histograms are very resource intensive if you have a lot of buckets. More questions? Oh, come on. <laughs> There's one. Okay, this is something I've tried to do, uh, and it's what you were saying about uh, maintaining labels uh, in your alerts. So when you're alerting on absent, uh, absent kind of likes to throw away labels. So well, how do you do it, it, it doesn't have them to begin with, right? Yeah, That's but if you, you can add them, you can yeah. uh, do absent uh, on a metric and then put some labels in there. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. But if you use a, a regex in there, then that is a completely good. Yeah. yeah, it can only there, do equal. Is there some solution for that? No, <laughs> there isn't, sadly. Because it, it, since it doesn't have underlying time series to work with, since they're absent, <laughs> it can only work with whatever you select by, and uh, it cannot produce a label, an actual label value from a regular expression, unfortunately. Yeah. So it actually only adds label values for the ones that have equal selectors in absent uh, oh, okay. yeah, selector. It doesn't, yeah, I cannot see if it has been there previously. And there. Yeah, exactly. It has no way of knowing what otherwise should be there that isn't there. Yeah, sadly. Yeah. Is there any difference between one metric with a lot of labels and a lot of metrics with one label each? Uh, yeah, so 
one thing, uh, the querying bit that I mentioned earlier, right? Uh, you still typically want to at least be able to query a single metric name without any further filters, at least in the tabular view, uh, to be able to even start formulating a query and narrowing down and so on. So I would recommend keeping a single metric name across all instances, you know, multiplied together to a couple of maybe 10 thousands of metrics, but that's already on the high level. Keep it lower normally. Um, yeah. All right, so I have a, a question about, so I'm working on something that, uh, ah. I'm, I'm just there, that uh, creates a lot of uh, histograms for metrics that I don't know and I don't know what the values would be. I don't know if you've answered that already, but. I'm kind of stuck with uh, how to choose the buckets appropriately, and I know there's the the, the one default the the default one, uh, but it's not great. And yeah. is there any best practices or method to kind of uh, dynamically uh, change or choose the buckets of a lot of histograms? Yeah, so dynamic choosing isn't possible at least yet, and we don't know yet if mathematically somehow it can be worked out. Bjorn was reading another paper, um, but yeah, it's it's, uh, it's a tricky a bit because um, don't use the default buckets because they are very generic, and you typically want to use something that really fits the latency profile of your service. But then you have to kind of know it in advance or manually change it once in a while, iterate towards something that is useful. That's really the best that sadly there is at the moment. Uh, sometimes you already know that you only care about certain latency boundaries. Like if you have an SLA of this many requests have to be under 300 milliseconds, then you can have a boundary exactly there, and then you need like one or two buckets. Um, but if you really generally want to know what is my latency distribution from the beginning on, then you kind of have to iterate towards that. I don't know if there's, that's basically it, right? Uh, yeah, fundamentally, if you want to see your actual histogram, you need event logging so you can get your actual histogram. Um, so once you know that, you can figure out the buckets. And the default buckets are meant to do something reasonable-ish for things between like a millisecond and 10 seconds, which covers most web services, uh, but it's just a default. Sorry, and, and nobody has done any uh, integration or third-party uh, library to dynamically uh, update uh, histogram labels or stuff like that. May I? Uh, uh, so, um, in civility, so choosing the right choosing the right bucket size really depends on how your data is distributed. So if you have a normal distribution, there are some <coughs> simple rules how you could um, dimension the bins of your histogram. So you have to look into the data. If it follows certain statistical properties, there are rules how to dimension it, but it's nothing that can be done automatically, I guess. Um, there's always some kind of uh, interpretation how the data is um, um, distributed. Uh, so the fundamental reason why the buckets are static and have to be pre-configured is that our computational model is that we want to be able to aggregate, which requires the buckets <coughs> to be the same, and we want to be able to aggregate over any arbitrary time period. Uh, and nothing like a TGI just or whatnot works under those constraints. So there are other systems out there which have taken different approaches and can do it dynamically reasonably well because they've decided, right, you are going to have minute aggregations. But we want any aggregation with any start time over any duration, so we end up that it seems unlikely there is a mathematical solution that will work under our constraints. But there are other solutions which might work for you. So there is the, quant the quantile, always, the summaries, uh, which have different trade-offs again. Is, is there a way to uh, monitor and alert at when you are having a cardinality explosion? Uh, yeah, so if you have a cardinality explosion, your Prometheus server is probably already dead. <laughs> so you will, <laughs> like a, a serious run, right? Where you put, yeah. Uh, so what you'll want to do is have meta monitoring, basically another Prometheus server or a set of other Prometheus servers that does nothing else than monitoring other Prometheus servers. Uh, and that will send you an alert uh, if they're basically, you know, they might become unreachable, but there's also metrics that the Prometheus server itself will output uh, about number of ingested samples, active series, and so on, and uh, you'll have want to have some meta-monitoring rules on that, yeah. Hello. <clears throat> Is it possible to use uh, different expressions for start and stop uh, firing alerts, and what is the best practice to use them? Not really. 
Uh, yeah, no, so you're asking something about like a hysteresis maybe? Um, no, not really. Uh, basically, you're formulating an alerting rule that is either active or does not. Theoretically, you could maybe build a contraption with recording rules and depend on some prior state. Uh, but then the question is, do you really want to make it that complicated? Maybe, again, Brian is kind of our best practices master here. Uh, maybe he has an opinion on this. There's a mic behind you. But I, I think it, then it gets a bit easier. Yeah. So uh, the thing with alerts is you want to keep them simple. It's like, yes, I could write an alert to do that, uh, but it would be unmaintainable by anyone else. Uh, yeah. You want, generally, what you're alerting to keep it with simple thresholds. Uh, we also often get a question of, hey, can Prometheus automatically detect problems? And the answer is, well, if you want to go create strong AI and destroy us all, off you go. Because that's, it requires intelligence to understand how your systems work. Just simple thresholds, you can create them. Yes, you'll need to tweak them every three months when the system changes. But it overall was far less effort than actually trying to get machine learning or anything working. We just sort of just choose the threshold that is bad. And yeah. that's it. So, but if you, if you do need some kind of hysteresis for a very special use case, you could do that over recording rules and then referencing the recorded result of you know, previous alerts somehow or previous states in your alerting rule. Um, but yeah, it's kind of, I've never tried it actually. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. Alerts actually, when they are pending or firing, they will actually uh, uh, create a time series themselves, uppercase alerts metric name, uh, with alert name and the alert state and so on. So you could even reference previous states of that alert. Um, just a really simple question. You mentioned at the start that you had to skip some slides about architecture and topology. Yep. Is that a, I'm really interested. Can I, I mean, is there a way for me to find them? Somewhere? Oh, no, I deleted them. <laughs> uh, well, or I, I didn't read it. To, yeah, sorry. They weren't even fully done because uh, I already noticed then, like, okay, I will ha not have time for this. So, uh, but I would have talked about. Um, basically abuse of the push gateway. There's a doc on that, on the best practices on the Prometheus website, uh, when to use, when to push. Um, some other things, what were the other things? Uh, federation, don't federate all metrics from one Prometheus server to another, only a, a small subset. <laughs> um, yeah, generally tend to avoid super exporters, these kind of big things where the, the pull model with the up metric and metadata association then breaks down because you have metrics from all kinds of things in there and it also becomes a single point of failure. Um, and yeah, I might have had one or two other points there, but that's kind of what I would have mentioned. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> Sorry. Hello. Um, I have a question about uh, these uh, exploding metrics uh, things. Um, if I have two Prometheus servers uh, and, and they are both uh, getting these uh, increasing numbers of metrics and, and they probably explode at the same time, yeah. um, maybe uh, it it's, it's, could be a good idea to have a grace period uh, to be configurable that uh, new metrics only get into or cre uh, create new time series uh, after a given period of time. So I can, can configure one of these two redundant uh, servers to just wait an hour before it creates metrics that appear afresh. Oh, so you want us to like buffer up all the samples for an hour? No, 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 or? just just throw them away for an hour. Oh. Yeah, that, that does tend to break everything that all the assumptions in Prometheus um, if you just throw away something that looks new, because Prometheus really depends on things that can just, you know, things dynamically appearing at any time, new labels, new time series, new metrics, and so on. I think that would break too many assumptions of the entire model. Um, yeah, too bad. Yeah. But so it was a bad idea. I guess, yeah, have meta monitoring for this, yeah. In, if you look at Prometheus' own metrics, uh, sometimes it will have the namespace Prometheus at the start of the metric name. Yeah. When should you include the name of the application in the metric name itself, and when should, when should you not do that? I, I don't believe there's consensus on this. Um, I, like, <laughs> I like the idea of including it in there, simply for uh, autocomplete <laughs> in your metrics uh, input box. 
and also just to very quickly see what something is coming from. But if a metric uh, is really a generic metric, like the number of HTTP requests received or so, right? Uh, you might want to keep that completely without an application level prefix. Uh, if you want to use it across jobs and it really has the same meaning across jobs. Uh, so the important thing is that is not an application name prefix, that is a library name prefix. The library just happens to be called Prometheus in this case. Yeah. If, if, if you were to you reuse components, uh, go packages of Prometheus and you pass in a metrics register, you would then also get that Prometheus prefix in there. Okay, so but I mean, if you have the alert manager metrics, then it has the alert manager. Uh, it has alert manager as the, as the name. Mm -hmm. Yep. Like the metric name is meant to tell you what the values values of the series semantically mean, and for some things, it just doesn't just make sense to have a prefix in there to actually assign some meaning, right? If I have a metric on samples appended total, like what samples or oh, Prometheus samples, right? It's part of the semantic. Idea of what that is. Okay, I mean, you. you some you might be arguing. Well, you know, you know that from the job label, but yeah, okay, we're out of time. But I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so you're more than welcome to continue this discussion over there. Else, there's toilets. There's toilets. We have a 15 minute break. There's drink up uh, down here, and upstairs. Uh, and see you soon.